So I'm super excited about our new sermon series, and it's going to be seven parts. And the series is titled, The Beautiful, Believable Basics. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue nicely? The Beautiful, Believable Basics. And uh, today we're going to be looking at our first installment, and that is a beautiful God. Now, in the seven parts that we're going to be going through here, they all have the same basic structure, a beautiful, believable something, right? So part one is a beautiful, believable God. That'll be followed up part two, a beautiful, believable story, beautiful, believable man, a beautiful, believable plan, a beautiful, believable miracle, a beautiful, believable heaven, and then perhaps most provocative of all, a beautiful, believable, what's that next one? Even a beautiful, believable hell. So this is where we're going to be over the next several weeks. And if we're launching an ambitious series that's designed to get us back into the basics, and that series is titled The Beautiful Believable, I suppose at the outset we're going to have to address ourselves to the question, what is beautiful? What is beautiful? Now, this is a very tricky one, and I did a little bit of reading this week on what beauty is, and there's a lot of different definitions of beauty, aesthetic beauty, and there's sort of some people view beauty as unique creativity, others view beauty as symmetry, others view beauty as color and saturation. And so it's very unlikely that we would have in this room with as many people as are here anything like a consensus about everything that is beautiful. I might see a painting and I might say, that's a beautiful painting. And you might respond and say, I don't think that's a beautiful painting at all. Or I might hear some music that I think, man, this music is so beautiful, it's so moving, and you might listen to it and be totally unmoved and actually find it to be not beautiful. And so we're not suggesting here that everybody has the exact same view of beauty, but that the principles of beauty are identifiable and knowable. Over the course of our series together, we'll be talking about what beauty is and how we can know what it is. And today we're going to be doing that in the context of the beautiful, believable God. A beautiful, believable God, which of course is the next one. If beautiful is subjective with principles that are at least somewhat normative and, and there's some consensus around beauty, what about believability, right? What does it mean for something to be believable? And this is another not easily answered question because your threshold of believability is going to be different than my own, right? Not so long ago, I watched a documentary on a, a cult and uh, in this particular documentary, well-made documentary on a well-known cult, I could mention the name of it and you'd know what it is, I, I, I found myself at several junctures in the documentary saying, how do people believe that? How do people believe that? And yet here were people right in front of me, evincing the fact, saying with all of the sincerity, all of the passion that they could muster, that they genuinely believed the things they were saying. And yet to me, it was absolutely stupefying, astonishing that people could actually believe that. And so when we talk about a, the beautiful, believable basics or a beautiful, believable God, your threshold of believability and my threshold of believability are going to be different. But what I'm going to try and do is aim for something that is at least defensible or rational, something that even if you yourself didn't believe it, you could say, you know what, I can see why someone would believe that. I'm not aiming for something that's reckless or irrational here. I want you to have some strong sense that this is not just an aesthetically pleasing story. The story of scripture is, is not just a nice story for children and, and for people who need help in life or who need a crutch to get through the difficulties and vicissitudes of life. I'm going to suggest that the story is not only beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, but it is in fact a believable story. Now when we talk about different thresholds for believability, we need to sort of put some points out in front of us here so that we know what we're aiming for. Okay, when we talk about believability, we're not talking about absolute proof. In fact, there are very few domains of discipline and of thinking that actually deal in what we might call proof. Mathematics deals with proof, and some things in physics deal with proof, right? But beyond the discipline of mathematics, we deal with plausibility. Does that seem more likely than the contrary? Is it believable to a rational mind and to a fair inquirer? And so I want to just start right at the outset. I want to give you two slides to think about. And the first is that something doesn't have to be perfectly proved in order to be persuasive. We will not be aiming for proof in this series because the nature of the things that we're discussing are actually unprovable. 
Now, in a sense, they are provable, but we'll get to that a little bit later in this series, okay? So we're not aiming for proof in the absolute sense, in the sense that you could go to your neighbor or to your friend or to somebody who doesn't believe, and you could say, I can prove to you the Bible is true. I can prove to you that Jesus was the Son of God. I can prove to you that God exists. Okay, those are statements that are impossible to prove to someone else's absolute satisfaction, and so we won't be aiming for proof, but what we, what we will be aiming for is a preponderance of evidence, a battery of evidence that will allow you to say, I am persuaded by the information that you have presented. And the second slide is very similar. Something doesn't have to be conclusive in order to be compelling, right? Perhaps a good illustration would be the, those of you that are married or those of you that are in love, you do not have conclusive evidence that your spouse loves you or that your uh, uh, girlfriend loves you or that your boyfriend loves you, but you have compelling evidence, right? You are, not, you are not driven by the evidence. You're not coerced by the evidence. It's not so overwhelming that you couldn't doubt it. But in the case of my own situation with my lovely wife, Violetta, we've been married 18 years, and I am roundly persuaded I am compelled by the way she conducts herself and the relationship that we, ha that we have. I am compelled to believe that the relationship that we have is authentic, that it's sincere, and that she really does love me. But I don't have coercive proof. It is possible to doubt that, and it is possible to doubt even the nature of the things that we will be discussing. A beautiful, believable God, a beautiful, believable plan, a beautiful, believable miracle. We will be returning several, again and again and again. In fact, in every part of this series, we're going to be turning our attention to three questions. How many questions, everyone? Three. three questions. We're going to ask these really simple questions, but they're imperative. In fact, in some ways, the series that I'll be presenting here at the ripe old age of 45 years young, this is the series that I wish I could have heard as a 22, 23, 24-year-old seeker, right? If I could travel back in time and find the purple-haired, tattooed, punk rock David Asherick, the ambitious skateboarder David Asherick, the one who, who just wanted to light the world on fire with his skateboard skills and his punk rock music acumen. If I could say, just, just give me a moment of your time. Give me a few hours of your time. Let, let me try and persuade you about the beauty of God, the beauty of Scripture, and the believability of all of that thing known as Christianity. This is what I would have wanted to tell him. So this series, I hope in some way, if you're coming in as a seeker or a non-believer, or even if you as a, a believer have some unresolved questions, what about this, what about that? And most of us do, let's be honest. Most of us have things that trouble us. The idea that all Christians are in perfect possession of all knowledge and that we, we never have doubts and we never have misgivings about the nature of our faith, of course, that's untrue. So even if you're, you're a believer, you're not a seeker or a non-believer, I think you're going to be hugely benefited by this series. I've already mentioned this before. If you have a neighbor or a family member or a friend or, or somebody that has inquired of you before, what is it exactly that you believe and why do you believe it? This would be a great series to invite them to, right? So over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be in this series, and it's also going to be available on the Hope Channel and on our website. So we're going to be turning our attention to these three questions. And the questions are, number one, is it believable? Number two, is it livable? And number three, is it beautiful? Is it believable? Is it livable? And is it beautiful? Okay, to sort of summarize what each of these questions are driving at, they're each driving at a different perspective on the question of believability, on the question of credulity. The first deals with the issue of evidence. Is it believable? Can a reasonable-minded, honest-minded person examine the evidence that's available and say, you know what? I can believe that. Or perhaps somebody could say, while I myself don't believe it, I could see why somebody would. Unlike the documentary that I was mentioning just a little bit ago, I was watching that incredulous. I was thinking, how can people believe that? I hope at the end of this series that you won't be saying, how could anybody believe something so preposterous, so absurd, right? So we're going to ask the question, is it actually believable? The next question, though, is equally important because we don't live in an academic setting. We don't live in some classroom, some, some dusty, chalky classroom. We live in real life, right? We live in, in the world where tires go flat, and sometimes there's more month than money, and there's international conflict, and pollution is a major consideration, and some of us are just trying to raise our children to the best of our ability. We live in the, in the real world of cars and of bills and of house payments. And so the question is not just, is it believable in some academic sense, but is it actually livable day to day? Okay? And then finally, we're going to sort of step away from the livability and the believability. We're going to ask an aesthetic question. Not a question of evidence, not a question of experience, but we're going to ask a question of aesthetics. Is it beautiful? 
In the same way that we might admire a painting on a wall or a, a beautiful movie or listen to a symphony, we're going to ask ourselves the question, is it beautiful? Bearing in mind, as we've already mentioned, that it's entirely possible, in fact, even likely, that we will not have exactly the same standards or assessment of what beauty is. And so those will be our questions. Is it believable? Is it livable? And is it beautiful? The question of evidence, the question of experience, and the question of aesthetics. So we start with our first installment today, which is a beautiful, believable God. Right? We're starting off with probably the biggest of all of them, all of the seven parts that we'll be looking at. Is God's believability and beauty, is it, is it defensible? Is it believable in this modern age? Can we actually still believe, or is this the stuff of fairy tales? Is this the stuff of primitive thinking? And I want to start by asking a question that some of you in this room have heard me ask before, and I've asked it all over the world. So if you've heard me ask this before, don't shout out the right answer, because I want to try and see if I can lead those of you that have not heard the question that's been asked before. By the way, those of you that have heard it before, you probably gave the wrong answer too, right? Right? Because almost everywhere I go, 99% of people give what they think is the right answer, but which actually upon scrutiny turns out to be an unsafe answer. And I like to ask this question. Is it good news that there is a God? Is it good news that there is a God? And I can tell you right now, as somebody who's asked this question all over the world, in dozens of contexts, in many countries, and in dozens of situations, the instinctive answer, and probably it's because the people that I'm speaking to are largely Christian, largely persuaded by Scripture, but the instinctive knee-jerk answer is always what? What do people say? Yes. They say yes. It's the same answer that you would probably give if you were put on the spot and you never heard that question put to you before, but because I've been in this church for about three years, some of you have heard me ask it on several occasions. Is it good news that there is a God? And people say, yes. And then I respond with the follow-up question. I say, are you sure? And I give them an opportunity to extricate themselves from this little, this little pitfall that they've gone into. And they say, yes, with even more enthusiasm. They think I'm baiting them for enthusiasm. <laughs> In fact, I'm not. I want them to think about the answer that they've given. Is it good news that there is a God? And then rather than giving them the answer, I ask them a question that immediately into, it immediately shows them the nature of the question and the way that they have fallen into a little trap that I have laid for them. I ask them this question. Is it good news that there is a husband? <laughs> now, let me ask you, what is the answer to that? Depends on the husband. Okay, now you're all giving the right answer. Is it good news that there is a husband? What's the answer? The answer is it depends. It depends on what? It depends on what kind of a husband. Right? There are some people in here, I'm, I'm hopeful that Violetta, Violetta, is it good news that there is a husband? <laughs> yes, okay. She says it's good news that there is a husband. So you get the idea here. Not all husbands are good news. Some husbands are bad news. I won't make you say amen to that lady. <laughs> right? The converse, of course, is also true. Not all wives are good news. Some wives are bad news. And so in answer to the question, is it good news that there is a God, it's going to depend it depends on what kind of a husband, and the same is true of God's. It depends on what kind of a God. I'm proposing here today, over the course of the roughly uh, about an hour that we have together, to give you reasons to believe in a beautiful and believable God, a defensible God, an aesthetically pleasing God. The truth of the matter is, is that most gods are not very good news. The radical contribution that the Jews make in Scripture and the radical contributions that the Jews have made in history is a contribution that, while not totally unique to Judaism, it's almost unique to Judaism, right? And there's a case to be made for the fact that it was, it was initially, proprietarily, the, the belonging of the Jews. And that's this radical idea called monotheism. Monotheism, the, the word simply means one God. And this revolutionary concept that the Jews have advocated vigorously since the inception of the Jewish nation, since there was such a thing as a Jew, is that there is one God. Right Now, this ran exactly across the current of all of the places and all of the countries and nations and tribes uh, that, that surrounded the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham. Right? What surrounded them is what's called polytheism or many gods. Right? Different areas had their regional gods or their regional deities. There might be the god of that mountain and the god of that river and the god of that lake and the god of that sea. So polytheism was the norm. It was the prevailing norm. It, it, was, the, it, was, the, it was the theory du jour about the nature of metaphysical reality. There are lots of gods. Some gods are happy. Some gods are capricious. Some gods are angry. But there are lots of gods. 
And over and against this backdrop of polytheism, lots and lots of gods, the Jews insisted, the descendants of Abraham insisted, no, in fact, there is just one God. And this sounded like foolishness to me. How can you say there is only one God? Well, who then is the God of that mountain? And who then is the God of that river or of that lake or of this sea? And the Jews said, no, there is only one God. Monotheism. Now, of course, there are other monotheistic faiths. Christianity is a monotheistic faith. Faith. Islam is a monotheistic faith. And there are others. But these are the primary monotheistic faiths. Sometimes called the Abrahamic faiths. All of them tracing their origins, both uh, theological, philosophical, and historical origins to a man named Abraham. We'll talk about Abraham next week and the week after, the one with whom God made covenants, right? And so whether you're a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian, you trace your belief about the nature of God and the nature of reality back to this monotheistic ideal, there is only one God, right? And the reason for that is, is that nearly all gods are not good news. I know this because I've done quite a little bit of reading about other versions of God, whether you're talking about the Norse gods of Scandinavia, the ancient gods, or some of the Germanic gods that were believed in, the Canaanite gods that occupied the time and space of Abraham, or we could talk about the Greco-Roman gods, the god of the Romans or the gods of the Greeks. The vast majority of these gods are not the kinds of gods that you would want for a neighbor. Right? They were not good news. And yet here came the Jews bursting, as it were, onto the scene of history and insisting that all of those other gods are false gods. And the various uh, stone and wood statues that were made to them were what they called idols. They're not true. They're an insult to the one true God. And the Jews took it a step further. They said not only is this idolatry, this polytheistic idolatry, an insult to God, they said it's an insult to you. Because there is something that is made in the image of God, but it's not that stone, and it's not that steel, or that, that metal, and it's not that wood. It's you. You carry what is called in the Latin, the imago Dei, the very image of God. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. Nearly all gods are bad news, which is why I have said publicly on a number of occasions, sometimes to the gasp of those in attendance, that I am almost an atheist. I am very nearly an atheist because I disbelieve in the existence of all gods except one. Right? There are millions of gods and thousands of permutations of gods. And I disbelieve, along with my Jewish compatriots and my Islamic compatriots and my Christian compatriots, I, I say that all of those gods do not actually exist. They are not real. They are figments of our collective imagination. There is only one true God. And so in that sense... I deny the existence of every God except one. I'm almost an atheist. Now the question is, is the one true God that the Jews spoke about, the one true God that Scripture speaks about, the one true God that Christians purport to believe in, is that God good news? And the answer again is, it depends. Because not all Christian interpretations, not all Christian permutations, not all Christian versions of the biblical God are good news. And we'll talk more about that. We'll talk more about that. So let's, let's just start with the first four words of the Bible. Right? You open up the Bible and you have these four words staring you square in the face. In, what are they? In the beginning, God. No explanation, no proof, no foregoing evidence, right? It's just right there in front of you. Moses doesn't set out to prove the existence of God, Moses being the author of Genesis. He just states the existence of God as, a, as something that possesses what philosophers would call pro proper basicality, something that is itself absolutely true and which needs no further buttressing or evincing. In the beginning, God, he goes on to say, created the heavens and the earth. Who is this God, the Hebrew word here being Elohim, in the beginning, Elohim, is this God, the Jewish God, the God of Moses and the God of Genesis, is that God good news? Yes. Well, the New Testament writers certainly thought so. And we could go to a great many passages, whether in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or Paul, but we're going to go to a passage in John, not the Gospel of John, which is the fourth book of the Bible, but a little letter called 1 John. And in 1 John, there's just five chapters in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, taking up on that same idea that in the beginning God, the same motif, which we also find in the Gospel of John, we find in his letter here. And he says this, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is, what's that next word? God is light. And notice this, and in him there is no darkness at all. There's nothing dark 
There's nothing mean. There's nothing to be terrified of. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Why can you say such a thing? Why can you make such an emphatic absolute statement, John, about who and what God is? Now, we'll be getting into that over the course of the next six parts in our series, but, but let's just boil it down to our one guiding principle here, our one guiding light. Some of you have maybe in another series heard me talk about what we call the table of truth, and that's, that's a table that, that uh, you know, sort of occupies metaphorically everything that you believe about God, everything that you believe about reality, everything that you believe about Scripture, and it's cluttered with a lot of different ideas and things and, and things that you learn from your parents or that you learned in church or whatever it might be. And, and in this illustration of the table of truth, I say what we're going to do is we're going to take everything off the table, not permanently, but by way of an intellectual exercise. We take everything off of the table so that what we have in front of us, insofar as it's possible, is a blank canvas. And we're going to start by putting things back on the table that deserve to be there. Because here's the truth. Many religious people, many Christian people, including the people in this room, believe things about God, about themselves, about the church, about Jesus, about reality that do not deserve to be believed. They're not beautiful and they're not believable. And yet they get on the table through various means and ways, through experience and through the ways that maybe somebody treated us in the name of God or said something to us and we, we incorporate this. But I'm suggesting here that insofar as it's possible, we're going to remove everything off of that table so that we have, as it were, a tabula rasa in front of us, a blank slate. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just, we're going to put one thing on there to start with. And this is going to be our guiding light. It's going to be our morning star. It's going to be the thing by which we allow everything else to get on the table or we don't let it get on the table. And that is found here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, in which John says, whoever does not love does not know God because, and then these three single syllable words, say it with me, God is love. And so we're going to clear that table off. And we're going to set that truth down right in the middle of it. God is love. And that will be our morning star. It will be our guiding star. It will be our absolute bedrock foundation. Nothing else will get on this table that doesn't square, that is not consistent with this basic idea of a beautiful, believable God who is in himself love. Now, we've got a lot we're going to talk about here. So you're going to need to put your thinking caps on as we explore the idea of a beautiful, beautiful, believable God. Miller J. Erickson, theologian, author, former president of the Evangelical Theological Society, says it this way. And I, I read this quotation probably 10 years ago, and I've never been able to shake its profundity or its simplicity. Erickson says, if reality is fundamentally physical, then the primary force binding reality together is electro electromagnetic. If, however, reality is fundamentally social, then the most powerful constituting force is that which binds persons together, namely love. Erickson has tapped into something that's really powerful here, and it's really, it's really appealing to somebody like me who likes to just sort of divide reality into either or. It's either that or it's that, right? To try and compartmentalize reality so that we can arrive at what the truth is. And what Erickson says is, look, 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 look. Something's holding everything together. Something is holding the world and the universe together as we know it. And you basically have two options. If reality at its most basic, at its most fundamental uh, uh, bottom, uh, bedrock bottom is, is simply physical, then the thing that's holding everything together must be some kind of electromagnetic or nuclear force that keeps atoms together, that keeps the proton and the neutron stuck together, that keeps the electron stuck to the proton and the neutron and the nucleus. It's, it's got to be electromagnetic. He says, however... If reality is not fundamentally physical, but, but fundamentally social, then the most powerful combinatorial force, the most powerful consisting force would not be electromagnetism. He says it would be the thing that binds people together, that binds uh, agents together, that binds persons together, that binds relationships together. And he says it's love. Either you have in the beginning God, the first four words of the book of Genesis, or you have in the beginning we're the particles. Those are the options available to you. And Erickson taps in. We are either dealing with a social fundament or we are dealing with a physical fundament. Which is it? And I'm going to try and make the case here along with Erickson that it is, in fact, social. These three words, God is love, contain such a bread, such a profundity and such a depth of understanding about the nature of God. Not just what God is in his actions and in his words and in the way that he conducts himself and behaves, but what God is in the nature of his being, what, what theologians and philosophers call in his ontology. What makes God, God? Not merely a question about 
uh, what, why does a human being do what he or she does? But what is a human being? What makes a human being a human being? Or a dog a dog? Or a giraffe a giraffe? What makes God, God? And here we have an equivalence. John has, as it were, peeled back the layers of, of, of obfuscation and peeled back the, the curtains and said to us, here's a window into what God is. And by extension, here's a window into what he isn't. God is love, and in him is no darkness. God is love. Well, what is love if not the principle of putting another before oneself? Love is the principle in the words of the Apostle Paul in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love does not seek its own. Love is in the business of, of looking out for you rather than for myself. Jesus would say it this way in the Gospels. Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for someone else. So love is in the business of saying, no, you first. No, you first. No, you first. But this raises a serious question about the nature of God, if in his very nature God is love, it strongly suggests that within the very nature of God is a plurality. Not a rigid singularity, but there is actually a kind of community within the nature of God. And I want to spend a little time teasing this out. In their book titled The Trinity, Wooden, uh, Widen, Moon, and Reeve write this fascinating little paragraph. Could we experience, they ask a question, and I think, frankly, it's a good question. It's a question that I'm asking you to take on board, and it's a question that gets right to the heart of Erickson's quote about the nature of reality. Is it fundamentally physical, or is it fundamentally social? So they ask the question, could we experience such profound loving unions if there did not exist a deeply united plural God of infinite love who has defined the very essence of the universe and the existence of those creatures made especially in his image. The very essence of living in love, they say, flows from the great triune Godhead of loving grace. They ask a question. Could it be otherwise? How, how could it be that we find at the depth of our own understanding of who we are, our self-identity, this strong, insatiable, unquenchable desire to connect? whether to connect socially or to connect sexually or to connect with our children. Why, do we, why are we not just, we don't just enjoy connection, but we are driven to connect. We are driven to love and be loved. And the question that Widden, Moon, and Reeve are asking is, maybe that's a reflection, the outgrowth of the nature of reality itself, that reality inbuilt to the very fundament of reality is, is a community, is a society, is a plurality known as God. Now continue to follow me, with, follow me on this if you would. I'm going to quote my good friend and friend of this local church, Ty Gibson, because he said it as powerfully and as persuasively as anyone that I've ever read on this. And he says, the, he says three is the essential numeric value of love. That's a big, bold statement, and Ty is going to try and substantiate that. He says, where there is only one person, love cannot occur, which is axiomatic, right? That's just self-evident. There's just one, what are you loving? Right? Except for perhaps yourself, and that would be selfishness, which would be the opposite of what we're describing. And the Bible says, in God there is no darkness. So Gibson says, three is the essential numeric value of love. Where there is only one person, love cannot occur. Where there are two, each is the sole recipient of the other's attention, giving place for self-absorption. Right? Let me just pause. We've all seen this. When that you know, young couple falls in love and they begin to look so googly-eyed at one another that it's as if the rest of the world just disappears, right? And so love can become selfish if it's just between two and can become given to self-absorption, Gibson says. He continues, but the moment there are three, each recipient of any one's love must also defer, humbly defer, attention to the third party. And each is the third party to the other two. Pure selflessness can now occur by virtue of the fact that each one must love and be loved with both an exclusive and a divided interest. The pure biblical genius of identifying God as a triune fellowship rather than as an absolute singularity or even a dualism is convincing evidence that the Bible is the revelation of the one true God whose nature is love. This is the point that Erickson is making, it's the point that Widden is making, and frankly, it's the point that, that Christian, Orthodox Christian theology has been making since the first century. 
The idea that God in his nature, and even before Christianity, there was this, there's these hints, these intimations in the Old Testament that within the very nature of God is a unity, is a plurality. There's an us. There's an us. This is why we discover in passages like Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, you know this, God said, let us make mankind in what? In our. Us is the plural pronoun. Our is the plural possessive pronoun. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That, that somehow, in some significant sense, God doesn't make a, an ace. By the way, there is such a thing as asexual reproduction in the biological world. You'd be aware of that. This is not the only option available to God. There are other options available, which raises the question, why does God make male and female two complementary figures together as representing him? Why not just one? Why not some androgynous gender? Or just, why does he make a man and a woman and call the two of them together my image? We're going to let a man in just a moment un unpack that for us. We'll get there in a second. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. This is an unambiguous reference to the sexual union, but it's more than that. It's not just the sexual union. It's more than that. Something about the coming together of the man and the woman in sexual uh, intercourse, something about that brings about a unity of soul, a unity of spirit, a unity of purpose. That there's a, even a, a combination of nature. I have up here with me uh, on this table a book that was published about four years ago. It's a big book. That's a very large book. This is a book that most people will not probably uh, want to read or, or enjoy reading. But it's a book written by a friend of mine, Dr. Richard M. Davidson. And the book is titled Flame of Yahweh, Sexuality in the Old Testament. And what Dr. Davidson does in this book is an excellent reference that, in my perspective, every sincere Christian should have, at least as a reference work in their library. What Dr. Davidson does is he goes through every single passage in the Old Testament that deals either explicitly or implicitly with sexuality, and he, he addresses it. What is it teaching? What wasn't it teaching? And if ever there was a time when we needed clarity on the issue of human sexuality and human nature, that time is today. Right? And, and so what's fascinating is that what Davidson does, of course, right at the outset, is he looks at the nature of man. And he sees that mankind is created as a, as a complement uh, to a woman. Man to woman and woman to man. The one fleshness. Okay? Jesus hints at, a, at another kind of oneness. Not, not a spousal oneness, but a paternal oneness. When he says in John chapter 10, verse 30... I and my father are one, right? So, so in the math of Eden and in the math of, of Jesus in the Gospel of John, one plus one equals one, right? Because I, that's one, and my father, that's another one, are one. Speaking of the, the, the passage that we just looked at there in Genesis 2, the man and his wife become one. The man is one plus one, his wife become one. So there's something about the joining of natures and the, the combination of two that come together that bring about something that is grand and glorious and some, in some significant sense reveals the nature of God, the beautiful, believable God. Now here's Davidson. Here's Davidson in one of the opening chapters of Flame of Yahweh. Notice what he says. The image of God is primarily a relational concept. You might have wondered about that. Lots of people do. When the Bible says, God said, let us make man in our image, we think, well, God must have had a nose. God must have had two legs. God must have had cheeks, and God must have fingernails. And I'm not denying that God has some physical manifestation or that he's capable of having a physical manifestation. Of course he is. But what, what Davidson gets at here is fascinating. He says that, that idea, let us make man in our image, what's called in the Latin, the imago Dei that you bear the very image and impress of God, he says that is primarily a relational concept. What do you mean by that, Dr. Davidson? Ultimately, we do not reflect God's image on our own, but in, what's the next word? In relationship. Thus, the imago Dei is not primarily what we are as individuals. Rather, it is present among humans in relationship in a word, the image of God is found in human community. 
The image of God is found in human community, all kinds of communities, which is why when we have the, 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 the reflection of the true, there's no one community can capture the essence of the depth and profundity of God's nature and God's love. And so it can be analogous to the male-female relationship, right, which we find in the Bible, where, where the church is the bride of Christ and Jesus is the, the bride or the, the, the groom. Right? We also find it in the father-son relationship where Jesus says, I and my father are one. These are not mutually exclusive. What the Bible is trying to do is, several years ago I was in the Smithsonian and, and I had the, the privilege of seeing the Hope Diamond, right? widely regarded as, as uh, uh, perhaps the best specimen of diamond in all the world. And what makes the Hope Diamond so amazing are all of its different facets. And as the diamond is spinning under these profound, uh, almost laser-like lights, it casts all of these different prisms and prisms. It's absolutely fascinating. It's engrossing to look at this. In a similar way, there's, there's no one window, there's no one perspective that's going to give you everything you need to know about God and His beauty and His believability. No, no, no. So the father-son relationship is a window into the goodness of God. The husband-wife relationship is a window into the goodness and nature of God. The mother-daughter uh, relationship, of course, which we find in the Old Testament. Can a woman forget her suckling child? Yea, she may, Jeremiah the prophet says, but I will not forget you. Jesus taps into that same maternal love when he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks. Right? Jesus is very comfortable embracing the, not only the masculine aspects of divinity, but the feminine aspects of divinity, because it is equally man and woman that are in the image of God. Amen. So a father's love is a window into God's love and God's beauty, and the mother's love is a window into God's love and God's beauty, and the passionate love of a husband for his spouse, for his wife, is a... It's a window into God's beauty and the, re the reciprocating love of a wife to her husband. All of these are windows. So that the, the sense in which I bear the image of God, Davidson says, is not primarily that I bear it, me, David Asherick. I do in a sense. But he says the primary sense in which I bear the image of God is in community, which makes so much sense why God would say, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, possessive, image. Let them, plural, have dominion. It is no coincidence that, that life is conceived in the act of greatest intimacy, self-giving, and love, which is the sexual union. Now, just let that settle in because th this is so obvious to us that we miss the profundity of it. We miss the beauty of it. Right? It's not a coincidence that the life-giving act is the act of greatest intimacy between two human beings. Right? The, the, the act that is the greatest love should be the greatest expression of love and of vulnerability and of intimacy is also the life-giving act. And of course, we live in a world that has been, you know, the pornification of culture is well documented now so that, that human sexuality has been denuded, excuse the pun, and has been turned into just the idea that if you have two naked bodies in proximity, that this is, this is the full, this is the sum total of, of all that needs to be said about human sexuality, hogwash. This is not true. Two naked bodies in proximity is only the beginning of the human intimate relationship, the human sexual relationship. It is not a coincidence. Yes, of course, we have technological means, condoms and birth control and other devices that allow us to short circuit the life-giving aspect of sexual reproduction. But the point is that when God said, you know, how are we going to make babies? Surely delivering by stork was an option available. I mean, God could have actually done that. There could have been a reservoir of children somewhere, and just when the stork dips down into the water, the droplet of water becomes a child, and it's delivered, you know, FedEx style to the parent. That's possible. God could have done that. Which raises the question, why not? Why should the act of greatest intimacy, greatest self-giving, greatest vulnerability and love, why should that be the life-giving act? And the answer is because it's a window into this beautiful, believable God who out of love creates who out of love creates. And the greatest damage that pornography and the pornification of culture and the polyamory of culture, the greatest damage that it has done to us is not sexually transmitted disease. It's warped our idea of what human intimacy is and is not. Wow. Exodus chapter 28, verses 2 and 40. I love this. Several passages that speak to the beauty of God. Speaking of the, the descendants, uh, the, the, the children of Aaron and of Aaron himself who would occupy the position of high priest, it says, you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Dress him up real nice. For Aaron's sons, I like this, you shall make tunics 
You shall make sashes for them, and you shall make hats for them for glory and beauty. Because the priest in the sanctuary intercedes as God for the people. And I love the idea that they were aesthetically pleasing. The garments were beautiful. There were all kinds of colors and jewels and gold and sequins. Make them look beautiful. Well, they are representatives of God who is not only believable but also beautiful. Probably the best known verse to this effect is Psalm 27 verse 4. One thing I have asked of Yahweh the Lord. And this will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence all the days of my life. Amen. Why do you want to be there? Uh, why do you want to dwell in the house of the Lord? To gaze upon the beauty. The, uh, this is from the Amplified Version. The delightful loveliness and majestic grandeur of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. I purposely chose this translation because of the word great gaze, which, which communicates a long look. To behold could be a furtive glance, a quick glance, but the psalmist says, there's only one thing I want out of life. I want to be in the temple where I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and contemplate Him, contemplate His nature. Just, just leave me alone with God in the sanctuary and I am fine. The beauty of the Lord. I don't know what it is that you think about God. I, I don't know because I can't get into your mind and get access to the picture that comes to your mind when I say the word God or when somebody else says the word God. But what I, what I hope to do in this series and in this sermon in particular is to, to, the, to have one of the words that comes rushing into your frame of reference, rushing into your conscience, is, is not just believability and it's not just goodness in some general sense, but beauty. That God is beautiful. He is beautiful in every conceivable way. I'm getting ahead of myself. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, this is telling a story from the Jewish history. It says, and when he, this is a guy by the name of Jehoshaphat, and when Jehoshaphat consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. What a, what a fascinating thing to say, to praise the beauty of holiness. How did they do that? They went out before the army and they sang, praise Yahweh, his mercy endures forever. He's beautiful and merciful. Something about his mercy, something about his attributes contribute to this beautiful believability that is the God of Scripture. I love it in the common English Bible. Jehoshaphat appointed musicians to play for the Lord, praising his majestic holiness. They were to march out before the warriors saying, give thanks to the Lord because his faithful love lasts forever. We'll come back to that word in just a second. His faithful love. Psalm 29, verse 2. Praise the Lord for the glory that belongs to him. Worship the Lord because of his beauty and holiness. Not just because he's God and he's stronger than you and bigger than you and he created, but he's beautiful. Praise him in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 90, verse 17. Let the beauty of our, the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. May we be a moon to God's Son. May, may we reflect the beauty of the Lord. Psalm 96, verse 6. Honor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. This is why the psalmist could say, The only thing I want, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that I may dwell in the sanctuary of the Lord to gaze at His beauty. And then Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 3, verse 11. A God who is Himself beautiful will make things beautiful. I love this, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. God is not only beautiful himself, he is an appreciator of beauty. That's why he said, when you put Aaron and his sons into the sanctuary, give them hats and nice sashes and dress them up real nice. Make them look good. Make them beautiful. Now, we're gonna, there's a twist on that that we're going to come to momentarily. What we're driving at here is that we do not know what God is in terms of his essential nature. Nobody knows what God is in terms of his ontology. His nature is mysterious to us. We do have these little windows. God is love is a window into the plurality and beauty of, of God. God is light is a window into his character. There are windows into what God is. But in terms of God's basic ontology, it is now a mystery and will forever be a mystery to us. One million years from now, you will be no closer to understanding God's basic ontology than you are now, probably. Right? It is, it is mysterious by nature of the chasm that separates the creator from the created. What we can do is we can worship it, we can appreciate it, we can adore it, but we can never fully grasp it. Not his nature. But while we cannot know his nature, 
we can know who he is. His character is not a mystery. The character is not a mystery. And here's an insight into his character. This is the passage I was alluding to just a moment ago. Isaiah 53, verse 2, we addressed this in our Sabbath school this morning. Speaking of one of the great, probably the greatest of the Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. He grew up before him as a tender shoot and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Speaking of the incarnate Christ, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, which is fascinating. Because we just finished reading that take Aaron and make him pretty. Put him in the sanctuary with nice garments and a sash and a hat and, and make his garments beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. But when Jesus came, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the beautiful, believable plan. But when Jesus came, he could have been anything. And yet he opted to not be particularly aesthetically attractive or handsome. In fact, I like the way the CEV contemporary English version puts it. Like a young plant or a root that sprouts in dry ground, the servant grew up obeying the Lord. He wasn't some handsome king. He could have been, but he wasn't some handsome king. Nothing about the way he looked made him attractive to us. And yet when we read the gospel accounts, people are almost, uh, 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 they're, they're attracted to Jesus almost irresistibly. Little children are drawn to Jesus. Roman centurions are drawn to Jesus. Lepers are drawn to Jesus. People are drawn to Jesus. But the point that, that the Messianic prophecy here in Isaiah 53 is making is, it was not that he was aesthetically pleasing. There was something attractive about Jesus that was not the outside shining out. It was the inside shining out. Something about who he is in his basic nature. God's beauty of nature is largely and necessarily hidden from us because we are creatures and will forever be. There's many different uh, passages in scripture that say this. It'll say things like, it'll say things like, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. When Moses requested, God, show me your glory, show me what you're like, God said, I can show you what I'm like on three conditions. Number one, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. Number two, I will put my hand over you. And number three, you cannot see my face. You can only see my back parts because no one can see my face and live. Uh, these are all just metaphors. These are just ways of saying, I'll show you insofar as I can, but there is an infinity beyond what you can understand. Uh, as Jesus said to his disciples, there's many things I'd like to tell you, but you wouldn't understand them. Jesus could have easily said the same thing to Moses there atop Sinai's summit. There's many things I'd like to show you, but you can't see them. What God is in his nature is hidden from us and will forever be. But the beauty of his character is revealed and it shines upon us like the sun. I've always loved this quotation from C.S. Lewis. I just reread this letter this morning that he wrote to the Socratic, Soci Socratic Society. I think it was of uh, Princeton or, or not Princeton, excuse me, Oxford or Cambridge. I forget which it was. But he wrote this fascinating little letter, and, and the letter was titled, or this essay was titled, Is Theology Poetry? And I, I reread it this morning, and I love his closing line. The closing line in Lewis's letter says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Now, when he speaks here of Christianity, he's not speaking of Christianity in terms of the history of Christianity. He's talking about the revelation of God in Christ and in all of the great truths of the Christian faith. God's nature is hidden to us, but his character is like the sun shining. And I love Lewis's point. I don't believe in the sun because I see it. I believe in the sun because by it I see everything. One of the ways that we can believe in this beautiful, believable God is that all of, us, all of a sudden life becomes more meaningful, more sensical, and more beautiful. Is it livable? Is it believable? And is it beautiful? And in each case, the answer, if we're speaking of the Christian God, the biblical God, the God that Jesus came to represent, the answer is yes. Yes, it is livable, and yes, it is beautiful, and yes, it is believable. Exodus chapter 34, this is the very passage where Moses says, what are you like? And God says, three conditions, in the cleft, hand over you, only my back parts. And I love this. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord. Who are you, Moses? says, I want to know who you are, what you are. Who am I talking to up here in this cloudy, lightning uh, summit of Sinai? Who, who? Who are you? I am fully revealed to you, but you not to me. Show me your glory, he implores. And God says, okay, I will show you on these three conditions. And he says, the Lord, the Lord, a God who is compassionate and merciful. 
Very patient, full of great loyalty and faithfulness. I said we'd come back to this word. This is a very important word in the Hebrew Bible. It's the word chesed. This word occurs some 250 times in the Old Testament, chesed, and it's translated in various ways. It can mean love, it can mean loving kindness, it can mean mercy, it can mean faithfulness. It's basically a whole lot of good stuff wrapped up together. God's beauty, God's character, God's mercy, God's love, God's forgiveness, God's loving kindness, God's faithfulness. Moses says, who are you? And God's like, well, let me tell you. The answer to that question is not primarily what do I look like or what is my nature or what am I made of? These are the questions that theologians have debated for years. What's God made of? Is he substantive in any sense? It's almost irrelevant because when God showed Moses who he was, he didn't disclose some physical being. To some degree he did because he saw the back parts. But the primary thing he said is, don't I have you know, beautiful eyes and what do you think of my high cheekbones and my long legs? What he said is, I'm compassionate, I'm merciful, I'm patient, I'm full of great loyalty and has said. The Lord passed in front of him and showed this showing great loyalty to a thousand generations, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion, and yet I do not clear the guilty. I am a God of justice as well as a God of love. Can somebody say amen? amen. Is it good news that there is a God? The answer is what? It depends. If this God that we're describing, if, if the God that is described in Genesis and in John and other, all the other books, of the if that God exists, is it good news? And the answer is a resounding yes. Not only is it good news, it's the greatest conceivable good news. You cannot imagine better good news. Amen. You can try to imagine better good news, but you cannot. If there is a God, number one, and number two, he looks like Jesus, it's the greatest conceivable good news. And friends, I'm here to tell you it's not only beautiful, it is in fact believable. We'll lay, we'll, we'll lay layer upon layer, point upon point, beautiful aesthetic point upon uh, evidence-based point, experiential-based point throughout this series. But friends, I want to tell you, God is good news if he is a God that loves and can be loved. Amen. I want you to just, you know, whether you have to physically do it right now, but in your mind's eye, close your eyes, or you're welcome to physically close your eyes as well. And just get that picture, that portrait in your mind of what God is. And then just ask yourself a really simple question. Can I love the God that I see when I close my eyes? And if the answer is no, you have the wrong picture of God. Can this God be loved? Not feared only, not worshiped only, not revered only, not appreciated only, not that he's just a great provider only, but that God, when you close your eyes, get, when you close your eyes and you look at who and what he is and the, 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 the various things that are on that table that we talked about, the table of truth, can the God that you see in your mind's eye be loved? If the answer is no, he's not the God revealed in Scripture. He's not the God of Jesus. If the answer is yes, he may well be. Well, how would we come to know who this true God is? We would, we would turn, as we're going to in the, in the series to come, we would look at the way that he has revealed himself, the way that he has evinced himself. The Bible says that God is, among other things, here's a partial list, creative, love and loving, understanding, forgiving, compassionate, kind, faithful, reliable, patient, helpful, fair and just. Amen? Amen? That's what God is. And, and I've got this book up here. It's a book titled, The Love of God, A Canonical Model, written by a friend of mine, Dr. John Peckham. It was published in 2015, received a number of awards and recognition as a serious contribution to an understanding of the love of God. What does it mean that God loves? And, and Peckham, in very theologically sophisticated language, but very persuasive language, sets out what does that mean that God's love? What does it mean that God loves? What is it, in what sense is God love? And, and, and I love this. Just take a big deep breath. Here we go. Because this is a big quotation, and I just need you to just absorb into your soul this quotation, because it is a beauty. Peckham in his book says, at the risk of oversimplification, God's love is, deep breath, virtuous, kind, generous, unmerited, voluntary, faithfully devoted, evaluative, profoundly affectionate and compassionate, intensely passionate, patient and long-suffering, merciful, gracious, just, steadfast, amazingly reliable and enduring. Amen. Exhale. Friends, if God is all of those things, then he is beautiful and believable. Friends, the God that you long for in your innermost soul is the very God that is revealed in Scripture and in Jesus. 
Dr. Peckham, who spent a decade or more studying and preparing for this, this seminal theological work, says, this is what I think Scripture is teaching. God's love is all of these things. And he continues, divine love is most often directed towards humans. Yeah, he loves the, the you know, plants and animals and other the things as well, but it's primarily directed towards humans and is continually manifested in action. That's what I love about God's love, he says. It's action. It, it, it does something. Well, what does it do? Action that grounds the divine human relationship itself, including what actions, John? How is God's love shown, this amazing love that you've just described with all of these superlatives? Well, here's some of them. Creation, calling, election, covenant, beneficence, deliverance, forgiveness, redemption, redemption, restoration, corrective discipline, and even wrath toward oppressors and evil of all kinds, and many other actions. God is in the business of not just saying talk is cheap. God is in the business of showing again and again in different circumstances, situation, context. He's showing how much he loves us. God's everlasting love persistently draws humans to himself, calling individuals to respond freely to his love and thus enter into a, this is a key word, this is a big part of Peckham's book, to enter into a reciprocal love, that means give and take, a reciprocal love relationship of mutual delight. Oh, I love that. God takes pleasure in those who respond positively to him, and he enjoys the most profound, intimate friendship with them. Are there any friends of God here this morning that can say, I'm having that experience. I'm having that experience. I can raise my hand. That God enters into the most profound and intimate friendship with them. Likewise, God's love is intensely emotional, akin to, and we've developed this, but exponentially greater than the compassion of the mother for her infant and the passion of the husband for his wife. These are windows that are helpful but ultimately fall far short of the, of the reality, the substance, while God desires and expects appropriate human response and faithfully seeks reciprocal love, he is often the victim of unrequited love. He longs to love and be loved in a way that is not identical but analogous to the way that you long to love and be loved. Friends, I want to tell you this. The good news God draws with love. He draws, he woos, he attracts, he invites the bad news gods drive with guilt, shame, and ultimately fear. And when you close your eyes, even if you were raised in a Christian home with a Christian book and you have Christian perspective, Christian background, if you see God primarily as driving you to some outcome, you, are, you have the wrong picture. God is not primarily driving you externally with guilt, shame, and fear. The God of Scripture draws us with his chesed. He invites us into a relationship not by the strength of his nature, but by the beauty of his character. Friends, we ask the question, is this believable? Is this livable? And is this beautiful? The answer in every case is absolutely yes. We will ask this question again and again in the Beautiful Basics series. Is it believable? Is it livable? And is it beautiful? And when it comes to the God of Scripture, the God of Jesus, the answer in every case is an emphatic Yes, he is a beautiful God. Father in heaven.